what we're talking about is going from the fight to establish these programs at colleges and universities across the campus, as our colleague just discussed, to currently fighting to maintain these programs at colleges and universities. Things are changing. Um, and and it's and it's should be of concern to all of us the direction that these changes are taking us. It seems that with each generation there is a decrease in the sense of urgency um, that establish these programs. There's a decrease in the sense of urgency around this notion of the importance of Africana studies and the African African centered approach. Um, I want to just take a few minutes just speaking from my own generation. Those of us that graduated high school in the late uh, 1980s and, and early 1990s, coming up under the Clinton administration and this um, strengthening economy and more doors opening, the rise in this notion of a hip hop mogul and this opportunity to really uh, create wealth among people of African descent. And so for some of us, that sense of urgency began to wane because we perceive certain levels of wealth and success for reachable and attainable because of what we were seeing. And so for myself though, I, I, I still felt that sense of urgency and I brought that to my undergrad experience with, at a predominantly white institution. Um, but I had my fist in the air chanting, fight the power. Okay, so I immediately got on campus, looked for the Black Student Union, joined, um, immediately became active and involved and we were uh, picketing and, and holding signs on campus saying that, you know, we don't have enough black faculty here. So we immediately jumped in from that perspective. Um, but there were still disparities in, in the numbers of those of us who felt that sense of urgency because there were more of us on campus who felt like, you know, it, it's, it's fine, things are changing, we're going in the right direction. And so, uh, some of those just wanted to kind of party and have fun. And so that mantra of by any means necessary seemed to change. It went from getting freedom and, and, and justice and equality by any means necessary to get money by any means necessary. And some of you know that there was a song to that effect. And some people really soak that in. Um, it, that, that I got mine, you get yours attitude started to grow. And so that brought some of us, you know, two decades later in, into the academy. And those of us sprinkled across campuses around the country, um, the ones of us that were lucky to be able to study at the feet of legends, like Dr. Karenga and Dr. Asante. Um, I spent some time at Howard with Dr. Melbourne Cummings. These people that we had read their works and now we're here and we're with them and we're just soaking it all in. So there, there's that group of us in that generation sprinkled across uh, colleges and universities. But there's also those who soaked in that get money mantra and that get mine mantra. And so this growing sense of um, self-accomplishment and, and, and selfishness um, is among some of us. So now we're at a place where we have the pioneers of these programs, those, those people who were a part of this creation of the movement that we just heard about, who are now at a, at a point in their careers where they're saying, okay, we're tired, you know? We've done all this, we established it for you, we laid it out, and now it's time for us to sit in the sun. And so, um, unfortunately, I, I know in my own experience at Stockton, I, I, it, I'm, it's going on 10 years now that I've been there, and I was inspired when I got there by this, this contingent of faculty who created this program. They created Africana Studies there very deliberately and intentionally um, in the early 1980s. And you know there were a group of them from different um, backgrounds and fields, from social work and from the sciences, and they came together and they created this program. 
And now I'm in a position where I feel like I'm alone among those who are trying to carry the banner and continue this because the others in my age group who are there kind of have this one foot in, one foot out attitude. So, you know, I'm going up for tenure, so I need these guys to support me. So let me do, you know, let me do a program and do something here or there, publish an article. But the, the commitment is lacking. And so, you know, I, I'm looked at as this, okay, you, you know, you got it. Well, I got it, but not by myself. I can't, I, I, you know, holding that banner is very difficult alone. And so, you know, and I, and I see this at, at other schools across the country, you know, there's that looming question of what happens at, you know, California State in Long Beach when Dr. Karenga decides to step down? What happens to the program? Um, what is happening at Temple University now that Dr. Asante has stepped down? Um, Penn State University, how strong is the program after Dr. Stewart? Um, you know, we've got lists of these where we, there's, there's concern about, and, and, you know, there's this kind of push by the administration to, you know, maybe we need to reconsider the necessity of these programs if you don't have people there who are going to carry the banner. So we really need to be concerned about this. Not to mention, when we get to this next generation, our students who are coming up with yet another decreased sense of urgency because we have a black president. We're in a post-racial society. What, what, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> you know, it, it, there's, there's, you know, it's not that much of a problem. And so then we're trying to fight to get them to read, you know, the miseducation of the Negro. Why do I need to do that? Um, and so that's yet another challenge because if they aren't behind the programming, then the administration sees that and says, well, then you don't need it. And so suddenly, you know, programs are getting swallowed up into ethnic studies programs and those kinds of things. Um, no longer African-centered, but just, you know, all people of color, we can just study all of them and that'll be fine. Um, so the question, you know, again, I ask, can we, those few of us individuals at different campuses continue to carry the banner of those pioneers that, that you know, we looked up to. What happens to our programs, uh, our departments, our centers, what happens to these things when they leave? Um, and, I, and I'm gonna, you know, I know our time is limited, so I'm actually gonna turn it over and let Dr. Merritt possibly address potential answers to that. Just continue for a brief five minutes that I have. Let me say Hotep. Hotep. Yeah. And I am pleased to be here as I always am for uh, the annual conferences. And I do want to follow up. I'm sorry. Okay. I do want to follow up with some comments made by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Allison. And this started out as a, a dialogue, a discourse, a very important one. And she's correct. You know, sometimes when we are doing research and you go to your research and you see what are the keywords you're looking for. And in our discussion, if I had to go find out what the keywords um, that I was looking for under Africana Studies, I might be looking for a word like uh, sustainability. I might be looking for a word like viability. I might be looking for a word like consciously and deliberately creating uh, programs. I might be looking at words like oldsters and youngsters, you know, they're old people and they're young people. And I might be looking at word like generational shifts. And that's what's been happening in this dialogue. Uh, certainly it's happening at Stockton, but we have looked at the state of New Jersey. And of course, as she indicated, when you look across the country, we think there's time now for some critical dialogue that needs to occur. I happen to be at Stockton, the distinguished professor of social work and Africana studies. It took me such a long time to get there. And that means that I've been there a while, and it also means, as was suggested, that you know, after a while you start getting tired. You know, you've been doing this for, what, 30, 38 years, and you think to yourself, okay, uh, what's the transition plan? And that's my question. What's the transition plan? What's, tell me what the next generation is going to do. I was very, very involved with NCBS for many, many years. And as I looked at all the people who were actively involved in NCBS, I also looked at what happened when they stepped down. Whether they stepped down, retired, died, forced out, whatever the case may be. It's one thing to have a passionate activist 
on your campus who demands that programs in Africana studies must be a part of the institution. And it's something else when somebody else just happens to take over. Just happens to take over and may not be as committed or as passionate as you. In the state of New Jersey, we had a very, very activist person at a college, Kane College, Dr. Barbara Wheeler. That college, and that, that person was involved in a lot that we did. She retired and poof, you know, uh, what's happening over there? We don't know. Uh, at the College of New Jersey, we had an activist person, Dr. Um, Gloria Dickinson, came to conferences, uh, engaged uh, in the various projects. Uh, she happened to die, poof, like, like what happened? Okay. In the state of New Jersey, we started looking around. And there's some fighting that went on in New Jersey also to create these programs. Do you know you could be a resident of New Jersey and attend a college at the state of New Jersey and you cannot get a master's degree in Africana Studies in the state of New Jersey? Wow. Princeton doesn't have it, Rutgers doesn't have it, Stockton doesn't have it. So what does that mean? So we took a look at, well, what's happening in the state of New Jersey with Africana Studies? Again, I'm from the proud state of New Jersey, but I would venture to say, I don't think that we've made a mark. I don't think when you look at the programs across the nation who have made significant advancements in the area of Africana studies, I don't think you're going to find New Jersey there. Now there may be some exceptions, tell me about them later. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm not sure that we can um, make that claim. And so the question that's raised is like, what, what are we supposed to do about what's about to happen? I think without a shadow of a doubt, we will be stepping down for a variety of reasons. Mandatory retirement, perhaps, uh, exhaustion, uh, turning 70 or 75, and looking around saying, you know, I shouldn't be doing this anymore. And the question as to whether or not there's another generation there that's ready is the looming one. Now, some of you have been beneficiaries of excellent graduate programs, PhD programs, and Africana studies. All you Temple folks can stand up and take a bow. We know that. but. <laughs> There's a limited number of temple folks that can take over all the Africana Studies programs in this nation. And so one of the things that happens is that even now when people are recruiting and they say we want you to teach something in this area of Africana Studies, there's no mandatory requirement that you're prepared in that area. People are still saying, well, if you got history, that's okay. If you're in economics, well, maybe you can just t throw some black stuff in there and move on. And so number one, we think, let's have some dialogue about whether or not there's a conscious effort to maintain some of the programs that were established in the last um, 40 years. And how is that going to be done? It's no longer going to be done on a single campus. One of the things that we have learned is that I wanted to say to my brother here, um, Dr. Rogers, yes, Boy, 40 years ago was wonderful being a student. I was a student then, oh yes. You know, we were making all kinds of demands, saying all kinds of things, and people were so afraid they had to respond. But I wanna say that was then and this is now. And so one of the things that's not happening is you have these singular campuses where students are rising up and making demands the way they used to. You certainly don't have that among the faculty. And so one of the answers to this problem that we're about to confront is there needs to be a much stronger working relationship between the new scholars, the new social activists, and the new academic leaders of these Africana Studies programs. And if they're not connected, then we're going to uh, slowly see, I think, the demise of some of these programs across the uh, campus. Uh, Donna Treese is right. You know, uh, what happens when the, the leaders step back? I, I re clearly remember about 10 years ago when Bill Little came to a meeting we were having and he was saying they want to dismantle the program at Dominguez Hills. Well, how could they dim dismantle the program at Dominguez Hills? I mean, Bill Little was president of NCBS. He was actively involved in all, all of the black academic stuff. What are you talking about? He said they're going to make it ethnic studies. Well, well, is that possible? Well, they did. I heard my brother, Alan Cologne, say, he used to be a scholar at Dillard. Not only he's no longer there, the program is no longer there. Okay, I mean, the program is, is gone. And so you ask yourself, well, is that just one here, one there? No, no. Uh, if you look at what was happening at Cornell, you say, who was stronger than James Turner? I mean, if you come after James Turner, you're coming after all of us. 
And so I think we need a bit of a wake up call. Uh, and we need to think more critically about how this older generation is having dialogue with the younger generation, but how much the younger generation is beginning to form linkages of their own. I am not suggesting that we go back to the past. As Fanon has always say, each generation has to choose their own battle. And they have to make their own contribu uh, contribution to the continuation of, of the struggle. This generation has to do the same thing. But they're faced with some different challenges. One of the challenges certainly has to be the fact that when students arrive on campus now, there has to be an aggressive re-socialization and re-education of the black students who arrive on campus. I love teaching. But I've seen students come to our college, I wonder where they were in the last 12 years. I wonder if there was a movement in the 60s. I wonder if the curriculum has changed. Donna Therese was telling me her kids came home this week with a story about Columbus. She said, same Columbus story they told her and told me. And so students are arriving on campus not only with antiquated knowledge, but not necessarily with the thirst to say, is something wrong here? They're not, they're not saying there's something wrong here because as she suggested, it's a different generation. And why are y'all still talking about that black stuff? That was back then. You know, this is now. You know, things, things have changed. And so we have to have an aggressive approach to re-educating and re-socializing our students. I took, took, taught a very popular course on my campus. It was called African Dance. The course was packed every semester. One semester they came to me and said, you know, there's no room for you. So what does that mean? We don't have any room in the studio. I said, if you don't have any room, I'm not teaching. So okay. They canceled the course. Students didn't say a word. Canceled again next semester. Students didn't say a word. So I said, uh, is anybody interested in this course? They said, yeah, well, well, why don't you make it happen? Not can we make it happen, because that's not their thinking. And so if you suggest to them they need to struggle about things, uh, that's a challenge. In addition to that, our campus, like yours, I'm sure, have students that come in and say, I, I don't need to take these courses. I was raised in Newark. <laughs> I was raised in Camden. I don't need to take these courses. And then we say, we believe you definitely need to take these courses. <laughs> then they come in and they call their parents and say, I'm taking a course on black studies. Their parents say, why are you taking that course? You know, uh, there's a book that came out about 10 years ago. And it's called, I think the author's name is Carl Bell. It's called, what college, What's College For? And while it doesn't focus on black college students, it focuses on college students in general. But there was an important lesson in that book. According to Bell, it's not like it used to be. People aren't cramming our campuses because they want knowledge, because their thirst, you know, uh, intellectual thirst says to me, I'm driven, I'm driven. They're on campuses because they want jobs. And they want an education that's related to a specific job. They no longer come to campus just as a student. They come to campus with two jobs, a family, a children, husband, wives. And when you say there's some critical educational challenges, intellectual challenges we must get ourselves involved in, they don't necessarily take you seriously. And given that we're in the age where everything is driven by a student evaluation or a test, a student score or something like that, you have professors in the position where they have to appease students just to keep their jobs. And so we are facing, I think, a very, very um, difficult um, situation. And finally, and a third thing I would say, if you look at the movement in the last 40 years, if you look at the demands in the 1960s, if you look at San Francisco State, if you look at everything that happened at the beginning, we were concerned about the intellectual stimulus that we needed. We were concerned about an authentic education that we, we needed. We were concerned about learning the truth, but we were equally concerned about our actions and our involvement in the community. That has almost dropped by the wayside and died. And if you tell me that that's not true, I can give you uh, irrefutable evidence that in fact it is. And here's my evidence. For many, many years, NCBS, National Council of Black Studies, engaged in a partnership with the National Black United Fund, whereas they allow people from an, all over the country, particularly government employees, to contribute their charitable dollars to NCBS. So NBA, NCBS scholars would go out and do educational projects in the community. Now, when we first suggested this, and I suggested it, people said, well, who's going to give to that? Well, thousands did. 
Before we could blink, we had tens of thousands of dollars. We created a program. We allow, we invite you to come and get a grant, a mini grant, so you can engage in a community outreach project. As Dr. Asante is my witness, we are still sitting on most of that money. Because the college, people at the college and universities who are now comfortably associate and full professors, et cetera, don't feel like they gotta go out in the community and do very much of anything. And so now we have another critical problem that we're confronted with. In the past, the community was at our door. They were banging on the door saying, let us in. We were saying, we're gonna get an education, we're going back in the community, we're gonna serve you. There's been a disconnect. And if we don't make that connection again, the very reason why we fought for Africana Studies, the very reason why we insisted that we have a program and a curriculum that brought together both the college and the community is going to die. It's going to fall by the wayside. And so for us, that's the critical question of the day. And we think there needs to be some serious discourse on these um, questions. Otherwise, what will happen, what shouldn't happen, will. Thank you.